introduce you to our presenter for today's happy hour and cheers, Dr. Pettis. Dr. Pettis is an assistant professor of medicine at UC San Diego School of Medicine and Division of Endocrinology. He was diagnosed with type 1 at the age of 15, which as a parent, I can't even imagine how hard that could be. Um, Dr. Pettis has de dedicated his career toward treating and educator, educating others with this disease, and he also works with the nonprofit Taking Control of Your Diabetes. Thank you, Dr. Pettis, and cheers. <laughs> yes, yeah, cheers. You know, I'll take it away here. So, um, I'm Jeremy. Thanks uh, for, for that introduction. And, you know, I just wanted to say when I was working with Jennifer and Will to set up the time for this, you know, we're kind of emailing back and forth. And they said, you know, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be this happy hour. Like, what's your favorite thing to drink? And I was like, oh, you know, haha, -ha, like, yeah, it's gonna be great. And then they emailed me again, like, yeah, what's your favorite thing to drink? And I said, well, gosh, I guess it's, you know, I like this beer called Pliny the Elder from Russian uh, River Brewing Company. And didn't think much of it. And then, you know, a couple of days ago, I got a, a cold case of this stuff. You know, it's called Pliny for President in the, in the mail, which was an awesome thing just to open. It just came in a, a brown box. I was like, what is this? And just, you know, to open it up and get beer was awesome. So thank you guys. Um, but yeah, you know, real quick about me. So I'm an endocrinologist, an adult endocrinologist. I have type 1 diabetes myself. I do mostly clinical trials in type 1 diabetes. Um, a lot of actually JDRF sponsored research. So I've been very involved in JDRF and very thankful for their support. Um, and I also see patients and I work for this organization called Taking Control of Your Diabetes, um, which I've done this talk for uh, at, at conferences for TCOID. Um, if you guys have ever been to one of our conferences, you know, we're, we're starting to do them virtual. And we do a lot of work between TCOID and JDRF and it's been a great collaboration, um, really just trying to promote education for people living with type one. So, you know, transitioning to this talk, I, I love doing this talk because honestly, um, for a couple of reasons. So first of all, it's, it's a common question that people have, like how do I deal with alcohol and type one diabetes? But people might not be comfortable asking their provider um, for, you know, information on how alcohol affects their blood sugars or how they can kind of handle alcohol with di diabetes. And to be honest, Practitioners don't really know what to say. So it becomes this big kind of black box where there's a need to know something and there's, there's a gap. So I'm gonna talk a lot about my own personal research with type one diabetes and alcohol and kind of my experiences, um, but then bringing obviously my endocrinology background to, to help kind of understand it and, and, and make it fun too. Because um, you know the honest truth is most people in the world drink alcohol and so why not understand how it affects your blood sugar and how to do it well so i love this homer simpson quote i'm a huge simpsons fan and it says the cause of alcohol it's the cause of and solution to all of life's problems and i think it's one of homer's probably top five quotes which is saying something so let me kind of dive into it so i feel always as a as a you know a physician and a medical doctor that i have to give kind of a caveat you know, when you talk about alcohol, obviously there's bad stuff that we all know about. You know, large amounts of alcohol can lead to liver disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, pancreatitis, um, put high blood pressure twice, horrible decisions, which in turn lead to divorce, jail time, et cetera. So we, we, we know that. And I'm obviously not condoning that people go out and drink in large amounts of alcohol, which is obviously a huge problem. And what I'm really going to be talking about is what the majority of us, again, do is just social drinking and, and how to handle that with kind of type 1 diabetes. So, which leads me to this question that, you know, people will say, well, people with diabetes should never drink alcohol. Is that true or false? And hopefully you guys, you know, are tuning in. The answer is really false, that there, there are some, you know, organizations that weigh in on this. So it's American Diabetes Association who have recommendations that women should have no more than one drink per day and men should have no more than two drinks per day. And I always like to say that these aren't like rollover minutes you know, it's not that if you don't drink Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that you just chalked up six drinks that you can have on Thursday, Friday. It's really that this amount of drinking has been shown to be, you know, safe. Um, some people even go so as far as to argue that the European lifestyle, you know, having one glass of red wine is beneficial for your health. You know, I won't say that, but this is for people with diabetes that it, it is okay to drink, um, which is important to know. Now, the question is, so it says the doctor says I'm allowed one beer a day. What, what is a drink? What is, the, what is the medical definition of a drink? And there actually is a definition uh, for everything that you're drinking. So 
one drink is is literally defined as a 12 ounce beer so keeping in mind that you know now i've switched over to my like kombucha this is a you know a 12 ounce drink but this pliny that i was drinking is at least 16 ounces so most beers that you get um you know at a bar or whatever are gonna be pints they're gonna be 16 ounces so technically a little bit more than a drink uh, a glass of wine is about five ounces, which is a pour that I'd probably be kind of upset about at a bar because usually you're drinking a little bit more than that. And then a shot is probably, is actually right on. It's like a one and a half ounce uh, like shot of hard alcohol that could be mixed in something else or whatever. But that's the definition of a drink. So you're allowed to have one or, you know, two of these in a, a day. And if you're having, so, so most people, you know, you might have a drink a night or like whatever. Sometimes people don't go, you know, don't drink during the week and have, you know, two or three on the weekend. And that honestly is, is fine for your health um, if you want my opinion on it. But we're gonna transition a little bit into specifically with diabetes, how to kind of control it, your blood sugars in a second here. So when we think about alcohol, what do we need to think about? Um, well, we need to think about the calories in alcohol. Um, we need to think about the carbs in alcohol. And these other things, effects of alcohol on your blood sugar, and then maybe on the other medications. And, you know, one of the issues or one of the problems with, that, with alcohol is that for whatever reason, there's a loophole that alcohol does not need to include nutritional labels. So I got both my drinks here, and you will not find um, any nutritional information on either of these drinks that I'm double fisting. Um, so it's, it's hard to find the calorie or the carb content. Sometimes you will see calorie and carb content, but that's usually on alcoholic beverages that are pitching like a low carb or low calorie thing. And they, they want to put it on there, but it's not a requirement. So, you know, we always look at, you know, labels and we're used to counting carbs and these things, but a lot of times with alcohol, it just is kind of, again, a black box. We're like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many carbs are in this or calories or whatever. So it, it, it is on us to do a little bit of research in terms of what we're actually drinking. So not to quiz you guys, but um, well, actually let me back up a second. So if you did ask your provider, what's the effect of alcohol on my blood sugars? They would probably give you a blanket statement like alcohol raises your blood sugar or it lowers your blood sugar. And both of those are wrong. It really depends on what you're drinking. Beer is different than wine, is different than hard alcohol. Is, so everything is, is different. These all have alcohol in them, but there's very different amounts of calories and carbs that are the things that will acutely raise your blood sugar. And even within these subcategories, there's differences. So when we talk about carbs and calories in beer, it depends on what kind of beer you're drinking. So if we start with a very, very light beer, one of these beers that's like, again, kind of marketing the low cal well, carb thing, an Amstel Light, 95 calories, five grams of carbs. So, you know, you could drink four or five of these and in terms of carb content, it's probably not gonna affect your blood sugar that much. It's also very light in the alcohol department, so you probably won't feel too much. Um, but these, you know, if you are a beer drinker, it's going to be kind of the most um, blood sugar friendly thing because you really wouldn't need to bolus, especially if you're just having one or two. Now, now we're going to go kind of up the chain here. So what about a Guinness? Um, and I had some fun just looking for, you know, memes for different alcohol things. Um, when you think about carbs, calories, and a Guinness, um, this got cut off a little bit, but 126 calories, 10 grams of carbs. So Guinness is, I actually don't like Guinness. I wish I did. Um, it's a good, uh, like flavorful beer with, that's, that's relatively actually low carb and low calories. Um, so I just put a, you know, a little special shout out to Guinness here. And when you think about a standard beer, um, I mean, a lot of the country obviously drinks Budweiser. I don't. Um, but it's just good to know kind of like what these standard, like a Bud, Coors, Miller, these kinds of things. 145 calories, 10 grams of carbs. But you can see that, you know, most of the time people don't have one drink. So if you have, you know, four of these drinks, you're thinking, you know, 500 upwards, you know, 600 calories, which is a lot. So there's a, there's a, a weight component to this as well as a blood sugar effect on your, you know, the carbs. So I just have this thing that says the IPA revolution that, you know, beer has really changed in the last, certainly 10 years, probably even five years where it's becoming like wine, you know, like there's good beers and people will go beer tasting and these beer tours. This is beermapping.com and, and, you know, San Diego, all these different breweries. Um, San Diego used to be a little bit unique in terms of all these breweries and IPAs and things like that, but it's, it's, it's across the world now. And, it, and clearly in the Bay Area, you guys have a ton of good beers too. 
um, but stone was founded here. Um, Green Flash is another good one. Ballast Point started in San Diego. Um, so, you know, I got into like the IPAs. I had to find this meme. Because IPAs are just pumpkin spice lattes for basic white dudes. And I, I feel like I kind of look like these guys and maybe I fit this mold, but I do like IPAs. So let's talk about how many carbs, calories, and good beer. This is just an example. Green Flash Brewing Company, which is just down the street from me, called West Coast IPA. And this is 219 calories, 20 grams of carbs. So when you think about that, if you have two of these, that's 40 grams of carbs. That's like drinking a can of Pepsi or Coke or whatever. So that's a lot of carbs that you're putting in your body. Clearly, that's going to spike your blood sugar. And then just two of these, again, is 400 calories. You have three of them, um, you know, 600 calories. They are more alcoholic. So these are usually between 7 and 8%, whereas a, a Bud or whatever is probably more like 4%. So I guess you have to drink less if you're, you know, if you want to, you know, have an effect, get buzzed, whatever. Uh, let's be honest that most people are drinking alcohol to feel some effect of it. Um, but it's important to know this. So I'll say this probably again, but everybody has their favorite drink or drinks or, you know, two or three, maybe four or five things that you rotate between. It's worth looking those up, at least the categories to know kind of what is, you know, what you're putting into your body. Um, so you can kind of triage that when it comes to the effect on your blood sugars. So apps can help. Honestly, I just Googled these things. I don't, I, I don't love these apps. I've never found any of them particularly useful. However, you, you can find this information. It's out there. You can Google whatever you like to drink. I just put Stella in here, whatever. Maybe you're a Stella drinker. Whatever you like to drink, just Google it at least once um, and find out, you know, in terms of beer, what you're actually drinking. So in general, one beer is about one carb serving, if anybody still uses that, or 15 grams of carbs. A little bit less if you're like on the very light, you know, beer side and a little bit more if you're on the hoppier IPA side. In general, the more alcoholic, the more hoppy, the more carbs and the more calories. So there is a price to be paid for taste, in my opinion. So that doesn't mean you should bolus exactly for that amount of carbs. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. By we, I mean me. So what about wine? And again, great meme. Um, so I just Googled a Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, um, kind of standard wine, and it's, it's a little bit more calorie, not little, it's definitely more calorie and carb friendly in general. Um, certainly more carb friendly. And it doesn't really matter white wine, red wine in terms of carbs. It's, it's, wine is actually very low carb. I mean, maybe if you get into the dessert wines, the super sugary stuff, it can be more, um, carby, but it doesn't really matter. Most varietals that people drink, you know, Chardonnays, Cabs, Pinots, these kinds of things are very low carb. So skipping ahead, when I drink beer, I definitely have to bolus for that. When I drink wine, um, I don't. So again, you're already starting to see that alcohol is not alcohol is not alcohol. It depends very much on what you're actually drinking. So in general, one glass of wine is about five grams of carbs. Um, so just, you know, that might be a helpful kind of generalization, whereas a, a beer is about 15 grams of carbs. So, you know, three time, threefold difference between um, beer and wine. So what about hard alcohol? I just got Maker's Mark here. You know, it's obviously been probably a whiskey re revolution too, or bourbon. Um, and think about it. How many carbs, how many calories do you think there would be in a shot? If I just pour myself a shot of Maker's Mark, it's actually the best quote unquote option in terms of diabetes very low calorie, zero grams of carbs. So again, you're automatically starting to see that for, for one drink, so one like whiskey versus one IPA, dress, you know, same amount of alcohol content, drastically different amounts of carbs. Now, most people don't just drink straight up hard alcohol, they mix it with stuff, and that's important. So this doesn't count mixers. So whatever you're mixing it with becomes the main, you know, source of, of calories or carbs when it comes to how to hurt alcohol. So if you mix things, and I just got a picture of, you know, this is two pina coladas here, but if you just had one pina colada, like a standard pina colada that you might get in, in God bless pina coladas, I love them. You know, nothing says vacation to me like a pina colada, um, but you're, you're gonna pay for it in terms of calories and carbs. So 526 calories, 61.3 carbs. Now the rum in the pina colada it's one shot or even two shots is zero carbs. 
So all these calories and all these carbs are coming from the deliciousness that's mixed into it. Um, it doesn't mean don't have a pina colada, but it just means that you have to be cognizant of what you're drinking. And again, you can't just say alcohol, all alcohol is kind of the same because it's obviously different. Now, you know, there are low calorie skinny versions that you can do, um, you know, where you can mix like the, there's like a like coconut water, the, the, the bay or bay um, to make these very low carbs. So there's ways around this. But if you're just going to go to a bar or whatever and order pina colada, it's going to be a lot of carbs and calories. And not to just devastate everybody when you're hanging out in your, um, you know, bathing suit, drinking your pina colada, that one pina colada, and here's my friend, the Big Mac, is, is very similar in terms of the amount of color, calories and carbs that you're going to get. So clearly, you're going to bolus for a Big Mac and, and bolus probably a lot. Um, and it's, it's kind of on par with, with a pina colada. I'd say actually a pina colada, you're going to need a bolus more for. So for every pina colada that you're drinking, think of it like a Big Mac. And thank me, I suppose, if I just ruined the, the pina colada for you. But again, I love it. So less alcohol, honestly, we know this is a good way to lose weight. Nobody's drinking alcohol because they, they're trying to get fit. I mean, everybody knows that it's not good for them. But you just have to be a little bit cognizant, again, about what you're drinking. Um, so to summarize kind of everything that I just, just talked about between beer, wine, hard alcohol, mixed drinks, you wanna know what's the immediate effect that these things are gonna have on my blood sugar. And I made this very sophisticated chart, which you can see here. Um, these are effects on blood sugar. So shots, honestly, I think they, they decrease your blood sugar a little bit, if not maintain it. Um, wine is honestly about the same. I would actually just have this as a flat line, if maybe not even a little bit of a decrease. Versus beer, and as you get into the IPAs, it, it's, it's more so. And then what I call foofy drinks, it's just a blast off in terms of your blood sugar. So there's a wide array of difference of what's gonna happen with your blood sugars if you're drinking one of these things. And you might be mixing them and just, you know, or, or whatever. So when it comes to diabetes friendly things, it's actually more down on this, this side. People are always shocked. I love it. You know, when people are like, what's the best thing to, to, to drink for my diabetes? I'm like, honestly, just straight up shots. And people think that's like the hard stuff, which it is. Um, but in terms of effects on blood sugar and diabetes, that's probably the best. I hate hard alcohol for the most part. Um, I tried to do bourbon for a while and old fashions and stuff, and I do like them um, because they are lower calorie and kind of a better option, but I, I, I love beer. Just, you know, I acknowledge that it's not the best thing for my blood sugars, and but at least I understand, I guess, the effects that it's gonna have. So I already said this, what's the best thing to drink with diabetes? Um, hard alcohol for on it. <laughs> honestly is the best thing. And if you don't like it, just straight up, just like sugar-free mixers, rum and diet Coke, um, you know, gin and tonic. These are all zero carb options that are, that are, that are good options. Wine is also super diabetes friendly. Um, if you're just drinking wine and you weren't eating it, honestly would probably drop your blood sugar uh, more than anything. So you would not bolus at all for these two things. And then light beer is, is another good kind of diabetes friendly option. And then the worst would be kind of uh, hoppy beer and, um, and foofy drinks. Now, what I didn't mention is the, this kind of new thing that's bust onto the scene is, is some of these newer things. And this is actually what I was drinking. And this is not Buchka, but it's like a hard kombucha. Um, and they've marketed this as kind of like a healthy option, like whatever, it's still alcohol. So don't buy into all the you know, antioxidants, antioxidants and, and all this crap that they put into it. It's still not good for you but because um, it is alcohol. But the point is that this is a, a form of alcohol. It's 7% for Boochcraft, which is, I think, a San Diego thing. We have June Shine. There's a whole kinds of like hard kombucha options um, that taste good. They're generally lower um, calorie, lower carb. So this, this is a good option um, that I think is, is relatively new or kind of you know, hitting the scene. So these are, these are diabetes friendly. Um, the other thing that people are drinking a ton of these days are these White Claws, Trulies, um, other hard seltzer that's seltzer water that's spiked with alcohol. I don't even know what that means, to be honest, what the alcohol is. But it's 5%, so it's kind of like drinking a, you know, a Budweiser or kind of a regular beer. Low calorie, 100 calories, very low carb. So again, when bolus for these, um, they come in all kinds of flavors. You just can't keep these things on the shelf, you know, so people drink a ton of these. They're very diabetes friendly. Um, low carb, low calorie um, options. So 
you know, and I say here, it's not that simple um, in terms of, you know, what to boil this for. So we talked about the carbs in, in, but what about the alcohol itself? So we know that carbs raise your blood sugar, but alcohol lowers your blood sugar. So that's the important distinction. I'll say it again. The carbs in whatever you're drinking is going to raise your blood sugar. The alcohol will lower your blood sugar. So alcohol, you know, not to be dramatic about it, but it, it poisons the liver. It doesn't necessarily, it, it's not that it poisons it, but the liver is, is very active in metabolizing alcohol. So when you drink a lot, the alcohol, or sorry, the liver can't do some of its other jobs. It's kind of focusing on getting rid of the alcohol. And one of the liver's jobs, a very important one of the liver's jobs, is to make glucose. So the liver, left to its own devices, is always going to pump out sugar. And when we take insulin, that suppresses the, the liver's ability to make glucose. So the way that I think about this is imagine that your pump fell out and you didn't eat or drink anything and you didn't go anywhere or do anything, what would happen? Your blood sugar would go up. And where's that sugar coming from? It's coming from the liver. So when the liver doesn't see insulin, it's, it's always producing glucose. It's, it's a way to kind of keep our blood sugars in check. But when you drink alcohol, um, so I have here that the, the liver normally makes glucose and alcohol basically comes in and kind of blocks that ability. So if you're taking, you know, a normal amount of insulin that's able to keep like a basal amount of insulin to keep your blood sugars flat or under control, if all of a sudden you have a lot of alcohol in the system, that same amount of insulin that normally is, is just kind of the right amount of basal insulin can be too much. So alcohol can basically, it's a, it's a short way of saying alcohol lowers your blood sugar. It makes the insulin that you have in your system kind of more potent, if that helps, you know, think about it. So this means alcohol can make your blood sugars go low but it's usually overnight or the next day. So what's classic is, you know, you're out at the bar or your restaurant or, you know, a party or whatever you're drinking, you're not really paying attention to your blood sugar, blood sugar goes high and it's really, you know, overnight that you can crash or even the next day, depending on how much you drink, because that's when you're not having carbs come into your system. It's the alcohol that's actually, you know, starting to kind of kick in and can make you go low. So when it comes to, Alcohol, it really is that roller coaster. High blood sugars while drinking, usually, because people are usually drinking and eating and, and whatever, snacking at least, and then low blood sugars overnight or the next day. So the bottom line for alcohol, and this is again why you can't generalize alcohol raises or, or lowers your blood sugar, because the carbs in, your, in, in the alcohol raise your blood sugar. You know, IPAs are a great example of, if you drink IPAs, if you drink three IPAs, um, your blood sugar is going to be 300 if you don't, you know, take some insulin for it. Um, but the effect of the alcohol on your blood sugar is to actually lower it. And the time course is a little bit different. So the acute effect is based on the, the carbs and the kind of delayed effect is based on the alcohol. So just shown here, um, drinking, blood sugar goes through the roof and then you go to sleep and this, you know, your blood sugars crash. And what you really want to avoid is, you know, this is obviously an old seven plus, is, you know, you come home from drinking or whatever, your blood sugar's 400, you take a huge bolus and then you go to bed. Because that's when you can get really get in trouble that you're like, oh gosh, you know, I'm gonna attain tension my blood sugars, I wanna correct it and kind of go to sleep. And I'm gonna talk about ways to, to, to mitigate that. Basically, you need to be a very conservative uh, with how you bolus your insulin, especially right before bed. So transitioning now into ways to, to tackle this how to stop the roller coaster. So, you know, I say always eat something before drinking. I just think that's a good idea in general. So you just don't get too, you know, intoxicated too quickly. I always say God made pizza and beer for a reason, you know, that you have the fat and, and protein and stuff from pizza that can help maintain your blood sugars overnight. Um, so having something in your system to kind of keep your blood sugars um, elevated is helpful because the liver isn't there to really help you as much. So avoid sugary mixed drinks. It doesn't mean don't ever drink them, but the problem with them is it just spikes your blood sugar to the roof and then you can do the rage bullets, you know, you're pissed off, your blood sugars are high and you can come crashing down. So if you are gonna drink the sugary mixed drinks, um, be aware of that, definitely pre bolus before you drink them to try to avoid the spike. But, you know, like I said, I enjoy myself a pina colada, but you just know that you're in for a ride. Um, Take insulin for beer, but not for wine or shots. It's kind of a good general rule. If you're a wine drinker, you're cruising. Um, you're not gonna need to bolus, and you might need to just be more protective on the low side. 
Same thing for hard alcohol. If you're drinking beer, you need to bolus. Um, and, and, and kind of um, jumping ahead again, is that I, it depends on, on what I'm doing. If I'm just having like a, just one beer, I'll bolus the full amount of carbs um, to kind of control that. If I know I'm going to be out, you know, like kind of a multiple drinks, I'll bolus more conservatively and just allow myself, give myself permission for that night to ride a little bit high. You know, I don't want to be 200 for five years, but 200 for one night is, is, is fine, especially when you want to avoid a dangerous low. So test a lot and, you know, hopefully everybody's on a CGM because it really is just the standard of care. Um, but if you're not, or even if you are, look at your CGM a lot before drinking, while drinking, before bed. And, and this is honestly, even if you're just having one beer, a great exercise to do. Hey, I'm just going to drink this beer or this wine or whatever and just see what happens to my blood sugars. You guys have probably done that. But really isolate it. I'm just going to drink this beer. I'm not going to eat anything. Let me see how my favorite drink really affects my blood sugars. It's, it's a fun little research project to do on your own. Um, always take your basal insulin um, before you go out. So the point I'm trying to make here is if you know that you're going to go out to a party, whatever, try to do all your diabetes tasks before you go out to protect yourself from drunk you later. So this also means changing your infusion set on your pump. If you're down to, you know, 20 units of insulin, for God's sakes, change it now. So you don't have to, you know, you might forget about it when you're out and about and all of a sudden it's 1 a.m. or whatever it is and you have zero insulin in your pump and you're totally screwed. So do things that you, you can do now so that you don't have to worry about them for basically the rest of the night. So as long as you have your basal insulin on board or you have, you know, insulin in your pump, yeah, that's, that's a huge, you know, step forward. So most people take their basal insulin if, if they're on shots uh, at bedtime, but that's a, a recipe for forgetting about it if you're out drinking and you know you come home or not that you forget about it, but I've definitely done this before when I was on shots where you come home, you know, you've been drinking, you take your 20 units of Lantus or whatever it is, and you do something else and you come and you look at your Lantus pen and you're like, shoot, like, did I take that or not? And then you're left with a two bad decisions. Do I take it again? And you know, now I've doubled the dose or do I not take it? Maybe I didn't get any. Um, so anything you can do to try to avoid that situation is good. Get a CGM. And honestly, this is a, a talk I made a while ago where when CGM was still kind of debated if you can believe it. But now, I mean, the evidence is just overwhelming. Um, every person with type one diabetes should have access to a CGM. Um, ideally should be on one. I know there's always issues with insurance still and adhesives and, and rashes and things like that, but um, it's incredibly important, especially um, when you are um, drinking. And, and one of the most important things about a CGM with alcohol is the alarms, which can you know wake you up in the middle of the night if you're having a bad low, um, because if you're gonna have a bad low, chances are alcohol is gonna be involved. You are less likely to feel it, um, and it can really predispose you to a low blood sugar. So hopefully the alarm wakes you up, but if it doesn't wake you up, maybe it can notify somebody around you. If you have a significant other, a spouse, let them know um, that you're, you're having a bad low. The one time that I had just like a horrendous low was exactly this, uh, you know, a party, a couple of drinks, went to bed, CGM was going on all night, I didn't hear it, um, but my significant other did and woke up and, you know, potentially saved my life. So having this is, is, is critical. So if you have more than, I would say, three or four drinks, you, you probably should take less basal insulin. And that might mean just less of a, from a shot from a, you know, Lantus, Levomir, Traceva, Trujillo, whatever it is. Or if you're on a pump, you could actually give yourself a lower temporary basal uh, dose overnight. Um, if you're on loop or control IQ or one of these things, you know, they, they're starting to do this obviously for you. It's, it's generally not aggressive enough. I'm current, I've been on loop and now on control IQ and still can go low if you have alcohol in your system. So you might consider giving yourself, you know, less insulin overnight. And you might even notice if you've had like, you know, six, seven, eight drinks at night, that effect of, of kind of just being more insulin sensitive can definitely carry on the next day. So you might notice that you just need way less insulin, at least for the next morning, and not potentially even the whole next day, depending on how much alcohol you drink. If you just had one or two drinks that night, don't do any of these things. You won't need to change your basil. You won't need to you know, worry about boluses the next night. This is really more if, you, if you've had more than that. 
if you were really worried about, you know, how much you've had to drink, setting an alarm, letting somebody know that you sleep with that, um, you know, uh, keep an eye on me, wake me up at 3am, just eyeball your CGM, test your blood sugar, those kinds of things. I say don't bolus right before bed. Um, you know, clearly if you're 300, you want to take something, but I would bolus, if you are going to bolus, I would say at least half of what you normally would. Be very, very conservative um, because again, what's one night of being 200 versus one night when your blood sugar is 30 and you're not waking up? So I know we all see those numbers and want to be perfect, um, but if, if there's any time to be not perfect, it's on these nights that you, you, you know, you're celebrating, you're having a party, whatever. So the, the take home message there is permit some hyperglycemia while drinking to avoid dangerous hypoglycemia, AKA let yourself run a little bit high to avoid a bad low um, that night. So target blood sugar when you're drinking 160 to 200, totally fine. And it says here, my important caveat, this is the Jeremy rule. It has absolutely no scientific proof. But again, if I'm drinking, I'm 180, 190, I'm you know, I might do a tiny little correction dose, but I'm not targeting a hundred, uh, you know, blood sugar of a hundred when I'm drinking because you're just closer to the edge of having a bad low. And it is harder to treat lows um, when you, you know, are, are drunk and low. If you think about a bad low you've had, again, there's probably been alcohol involved because you just feel just awful. Um, so finishing up with just a couple other like uh, tidbits. Sometimes people will read or will deduce from their cells, they'll say, hey, does glucagon work when you're drinking? And the way that glucagon works, so glucagon obviously is, you know, for bad lows, you have to inject it. Um, it, you know, raises your blood sugar by working on the liver to increase glucose output. That's how glucagon works. So if, if the liver has been affected by alcohol, does glucagon work? And the answer is it does, because you give such a big slug of glucagon that it absolutely still works. And the bottom line is it says effect may be less, but can still break, uh, break down remaining glycogen in the liver. Don't worry about that so much. But bottom line is if you need it, use it. This is more for college kids. And you know, a problem with being um, drunk is that it looks really like being low. Um, so you know, when I say in the next slides, you know, get a drinking buddy, which I think I, maybe I, I have coming up, is you want somebody that, is around you when you're drinking to know that you have type 1 diabetes. So they, you can't just be allowed to just kind of slump over in the corner or pass out because, yeah, you might be drunk, but you might also be having, you know, a terrible low. Um, so that's important to know about. So because I, I mentioned glucagon, I just want to mention that it, it's really been like a breakthrough in terms of these new formulations of glucagon. And, and this is independent of alcohol. If you're just having a bad low, everybody with type 1 diabetes should have glucagon um, at their house or somewhere that's available to them. And you might say, well, I've never had to use it. Well, you never have to use it until you have to use it. And, you know, I think I'm a pretty smart guy and know a lot about diabetes and I'm an endocrinologist and all that. Um, but I've had to use glucagon. You know, I wrote a story about this time that I accidentally, instead of taking my, my basal insulin, um, I took a, a rapid acting insulin. I took like 30 units of, of Humalog. And I was, just, was you know, confused why, why I couldn't get this low to go away. I was eating everything in sight. Um, you know, I ate like a whole thing of Oreos and pizza and multiple bowls of cereal and was still low. And finally just had to take glucagon because I couldn't eat anymore. So the point is just, it, you, you need to have this stuff around. And it used to, we've always had this Lily glucagon kit, which is the red little suitcase, um, which is great, but it's, it, the glucagon is a powder and you have to take the syringe, inject it into the vial, shake it up, draw it out, and then inject it, which honestly is not that difficult. If you were just sitting here, I could tell you how to do it real easy. It becomes extremely difficult when you need to use it and someone's having a seizure or whatever. The last thing you wanna be doing is reading instructions on how to, how to do this. So there's these new glucagon options, which everybody should know about. So on the left is one called Baxini, which is actually a nasal uh, formulation where you just shoot it into, it's, it's kind of a spray, a nasal spray into somebody's nose and they don't have to be conscious. They don't have to like breathe it in through their nose. You just put it in their nose and, and, and they inhale it and, and all good. And then this, there's a company called Xerus, which has made a two different formulations, this pre-filled syringe where it's all loaded in the syringe. You just inject it. Um, you inject it manually. So if you want, if you did want to, to mini dose it, you could, you know, take a quarter of it or a half dose of it or whatever. So that's the advantage of of kind of this syringe, but they also have this auto injector pen, which is more like an EpiPen where you don't even see the needle 
and you give yourself, you know, you just push the button and it auto injects it. So glucagon is really not for you to give if you have type one diabetes, it's for your friends or family to give you if you have a bad low. Um, so talking to them about what they'd be most comfortable with, you know, maybe it's the nasal one, but maybe if you're thrashing around and having a seizure, maybe it's hard to find, you know, get it in your nose. So maybe the auto injector is the way to go, but being aware of this. And again, every single person should have this. And I believe the shelf life on these now are room temperature for two years, um, which makes it, you know, easier to, to, to get a prescription and have it around. All right. I mentioned kind of closing up here, having a drinking buddy. And by what I mean by that, awesome. If you have a friend to go drinking with, but what I mean by that is somebody, again, that knows you have type 1 diabetes, knows that they can't just let you just kind of be confused or, you know, it's not just like Jeremy being silly. It's like, hey, let's check his blood sugar and see where he's at um, and, and, you know, get you some juice or whatever you need. Um, wear a medic alert bracelet, some kind of identifier that tells people that you have type 1 diabetes. Um, you know, people a lot of the times will say, well, I wear an insulin pump and a, and a CGM. So obviously people will know. Paramedics are not trained to look on your belt or your, you know, your bra or whatever you clip your belt, your, your, your uh, pump to. They're trained to look at wrists and the neck area to see if you have a medical condition. So don't feel that just because you have a pump or a CGM that people will know you have type 1 diabetes. So um, this is mostly important for kind of college age kids, high school, um, that, you know, might be doing really kind of heavy drinking, that it's, a, you, you really have to have one of these. And, and then like when I was in high school and college, they were the nerdy, you know, metal ones that I hated wearing. Um, but now they have kind of more of the like rubber band, kind of like Lance Armstrong, Live Strong type thing. So they, they can be a little bit cooler, um, but having some kind of identifier is important. Don't be embarrassed about testing when you're out. And, and this has obviously gotten easier with just glancing at your CGM, seeing what your blood sugars are on your watch, all that kind of stuff. But it's important. Uh, if you're ever going to want to know what your blood sugar is, it's, it's when you're drinking. And then I, I would say it says eat before going to bed if your blood sugar is less than 180. And what I mean by that, again, is this idea that you want to aim on the higher side if you've, if you've really been having, you know, more than just one or two drinks. So two quotes to end with is this, this is Elliot Joslin. Was, they, they call him kind of the father of type 1 diabetes management. It's the Joslin Clinic now in, in Boston. Um, it has this great quote, the person with diabetes knows the most, lives the longest, meaning you just got to stay educated. And, you know, alcohol is, is, is a great example of a way that you really have to advocate for yourself, learn about what you're drinking, learn the effects on your blood sugar. And, and once you know that, you're going to be fine. You know, I'm an expert in this, obviously. I've been doing research for years and I'm still ticking. So I like this meme because there's anybody you want to grab a drink tonight and it's just me, like I'm, I'm down, I'm in. So I, I just I wanted to end with this because I didn't want people to be scared about, you know, that they shouldn't be drinking alcohol, or they're going to have low blood sugars or whatever. It's just knowing the facts associated with it. And most people will, will never have a problem. Um, but it, it's just, again, I think a great topic to, to talk about. And with that, I think it's, it's perfect to have kind of our happy hour and, you know, have a drink. It's Friday evening, if, if Friday is still a thing anymore, and, um, and celebrate. So... Thank you. And there's my name. And if anybody has questions, my email is, it's just Jay Pettis, my last name, Jay Pettis at ucsd.edu, which I don't have on there when I usually do. So I'll